Okay, so uh, without further delay, since it is 2.30, we are here uh, in the virtual world of uh, Mizoram University, where uh, we will not have Mr. COVID-19 slow us down in our uh, you know, academic endeavor. So today we have very, very highly esteemed uh, psychologist, one from Hyderabad, that is the capital, that is in the capital, is the capital of Telangana state in southern India. Uh, uh, Professor Meena Hariharan, who is the founder president of Association of Health Psychologists in India. Under the University of Hyderabad, she has been heading uh, the center of health psychology, the one and only in India. And we have here also Dr. Vanlal Khanzami, uh, uh, who is from the Department of Psychology, Jeffrey Chia School of Medicine and Health Sciences, Monash University, Malaysia. Uh, we will be having uh, them both for, I hope, 45 minutes and a little bit more, few minutes more than that. So at least one and a half hours fully. And uh, before we go on the introduction and the webinar, I would like to state a few ground rules. We have uh, many uh, participants joining us already and many more will be coming in. Uh, now questions, we're going to have uh, after a uh, 30 minute or so presentation by both the speakers, uh, we will be having a Q&A session uh, for about 10 minutes. And uh, the Q&A session will be plucked from the Q&A here that everybody should be able to see on their screen. Uh, chat is fine. We see all the hellos there. And hello back to every one of you. Uh, but we will be taking questions only from the Q&A. So please, uh, all those questions, please pose them uh, in the Q&A. And uh, of course, presentation uh, will be given by both the uh, speakers. And uh, so that's that about the ground rule. So we can, I think, go ahead uh, with the first presentation, that is Professor Meena Hariharan. And uh, I would like to invite my colleague, Dr. Zothan Moya, to do the honor of introducing Professor Meena. Moya, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Our speaker for the first session, as we know, is Professor Meena Hariharan. And we have heard that she is the founder president of the Association of Health Psychologists, India. And she has been heading the Center for Health Psychology at the University of Hyderabad. Previously, she served in academics and administrative capacities in the Academic Staff College, University of Hyderabad. She was also a specialist in psychology for UNICEF project of State Resource Center, Andhra Mahila Sabha College of Education, Hyderabad. And she was also a researcher at the National Institution of Nutrition, Hyderabad. She has completed 25 research projects that received funding from international, national and state agencies. She has had several significant contributions in the field of health, psychology, and organized several national level seminars. She has received two awards based on her work in cardiology and published several books, one by Sage and over 80 research articles. We are extremely grateful to have you as our esteemed speaker. Over to you, Madam Professor Meena Hariharan. Thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, a small correction, I'm no more the head Center for Health Psychology uh, from 1st July. I'm not the head anymore. So I was the head for the past 13 years. Now, Thanks for inviting me to this beautiful webinar. Uh, the concept and the way it is organized such in such a meticulous and systematic way, I should congratulate the head and her team for the 
way she has been taking care of even the finest of fine details of the seminar so that everything is well organized. That talks about your efficiency and teamwork, ma'am. Now, good afternoon to all the participants who have registered for this particular webinar. I feel honored to speak to you on a topic that is very contemporary in nature, that is COVID stress and coping towards resilience. I shall be speaking on this topic based on our experience with COVID related anxiety depression and stress because from association of health psychologists we started a helpline where anyone from any part of the country could call us and then discuss about their stress so we have collaborated with many universities like padmavati mahila university and two more universities in andhra odisha central university and uh, uh, UNICEF, Action Aid, and other places, uh, other organizations, both here and also in Karnataka and Andhra and West Bengal. So, based on the thousands of calls that we have received since March this year, I'll be making my presentation. Before we go on to talk about the subject, I would just like to take you to what is stress and coping or what is coping with stress in general. Then we would come to coping with COVID. Now, when you are talking about coping with stress, there are many contributing factors. These contributing factors can be the appraisal, that is the cognitive appraisal of the situation, emotional management, and the behavioral repertoire that a person has. <clears throat> so when you're coming to the appraisal of the situation, there is a stressful situation, and you want to cope with the stress. First of all, you need to perceive what the situation is, how the situation is, and attribute certain characteristics to the situation. There, you will attribute and you will perceive a situation depending upon the locus of control that you perceive, whether the control is internal or external. So, second thing is, you will assess the situation based on the resources available. The resources relate both to internal resources as well as the resources from outside in terms of material resources, social networking, and political and economic support that you may be getting from outside in order to cope with any situation. And the third aspect related to cognitive appraisal is your explanatory style. Whether your explanatory style is optimistic or pessimistic. This again depends upon your attributional factors. Whether how you are attributing the um, situation to the cause of it, to the impact of it, and the stability of it. So, depending upon that, you would be categorized into either optimistic style or pessimistic style. For example, supposing there is a stressful situation and you feel all the time you attribute it to your own wrong deed. I am the cause of this misery. So, the more you think and you attribute it to yourself, the more there will be emotions that will be negative emotions that will get generated. The second part of it is the impact, whether the impact of a particular stressful situation is on that particular context or whether the impact is spreading across the other dimensions of life. For example, failure in an examination. How are you attributing it? Whether you are thinking that the impact is going to be only on your career or are you feeling that the impact is going to have a detrimental effect on your interpersonal relationship, on your self-esteem, on your earning capacity, etc. 
So the minute you say that the impact is global, not specific, then it will go into a pessimistic style. The third factor is the stability of it, whether it is stable, that is in the timeline, whether it is stable or unstable. If you are saying that the, imp the impact of it is going to be stable, then you will say that the impact of this stress is going to be there throughout my life. That again is a pessimistic style. So depending upon whether the LOC is internal, whether the resources are available, both in terms of individual resources and external resources, and how you are attributing or explaining a particular situation, you would be either on perceiving a particular situation as a threat or as a challenge. Supposing you attribute the cause to an external causal condition and think that it is unstable and the impact is only specific, then you perceive not a threat, but more a challenge. Then you will be optimistic. The second part of it is about the emotional management. So when you are talking about the emotion, see, whenever there is a stress, it also invokes certain negative emotions from within. It could be anger, it could be hurt, it could be humiliation, it could be dejection, it could be depression, it could be anxiety. So any, I mean, it, the same situation may even generate a number of negative emotions. So these emotions need to be either ventilated or they have to be counterbalanced. Ventilation, all of us know. I don't have to go into the details of it. Counterbalancing is, a, a, supposing there are a lot of negative emotions, you try to work on the positivities of your life and then invoke the positive emotions out of the positive experiences of life, then this positivity is going to counterbalance the negative emotions that the stressful situation invokes. The third aspect is the behavioral repertoire. How many types of coping strategies that you have in your repertoire? So the more number of strategies that you are aware of and that you are used to, the more flexible your coping style is. And then the second part of the behavioral rep repertoire relates to whether you are going in for problem-focused coping or emotion-focused coping. Problem-focused coping are more directed towards finding a solution to the problem, coming to a conclusion. Whereas emotion-focused coping will be I mean, uh, helping you in managing your emotion. Now let us come to Corona and the perception of Corona and the attribution that we have for Corona as a virus. Now, the Corona that we all know today or the way we define it is it's a deadly virus with all bad characteristics. And one of the deadly characteristics is the exponential spread. The way it spreads like nobody's business and it impacts chunks of population. So everything is negative about it. But go back to the other meaning of Corona. So you will see that Corona actually means it is a white or colored circle or a set of concentrated circles circles of light seen around luminous body, especially the sun. Now, it is a beautiful ring. I mean, we can call it a diamond ring, in fact. So, it is a beautiful diamond ring. Now, when you are looking at the first definition, a deadly virus with bad characteristics, then the cognitive appraisal is something, I mean, which is very uncertain. There is a uh, a, a factor of permanency of its stay in humankind. But when you are looking at the other definition, a beautiful white ring, which is like a diamond around the sun, then it talks about the transient condition. Now transfer that trans transient attribution to the deadly corona that we are having. Then 
the entire cognitive appraisal is going to change. Now, uh, when we are talking about resilience, there are certain factors that we need to know before we understand resilience. Whenever we have come across a number of cases where we find that a viral fever attacks the entire family, all the members are impacted except one person. Similarly, I mean, normally physical, physically challenged people are not found to be excelling in sports, but we have case studies where the physically challenged are the, I mean, uh, people with uh, physical disability, they have excelled in certain sports like swimming, basketball, I mean, um, um, badminton, tennis, etc. Except this person, no one else can play. Similarly, if there is a sudden death in a family, everybody is totally doomed, they are totally devastated, and they are totally gloomy, except one person in the family, and that one person takes control of the entire situation. These exceptions in every situation that I talked about, actually, they are the people who are resilient. So resilience refers to such exceptions that we come across in our life, where people, despite a number of adversities, they excel in life because of certain protective factors and promotive factors. Now let us come to COVID. And what are the main factors that, are talk, that we can talk about where individuals or the society or the nation get stressed because of COVID? Now let us take at first the individual cases. We will see here that, sorry, ah, when you are talking about the individual cases, you see that the individual cases are patients suffering from COVID, people who are quarantined, the family members of COVID patients, migrant laborers, particularly in the early stages of the spread of COVID in our country, and also the healthcare workers. When you are coming to the society organizations, the impact is seen mostly on educational institutions, government establishment, commercial establishment, unskilled and semi-skilled workers, employees of production units and travel sectors. These are, I mean, this is not exhaustive. There may be many other. Just to give you certain examples, these are the organizations which took the bent or which took the toll of COVID very badly. And when you're coming to the nation as such, India has been taking the impact, the negative impact of COVID since March this year. And we have seen how it negatively impacted the economy, polity, health and welfare sector, travel and mobility. As if COVID is not sufficient, to devastate us, we, the nation had to face cyclone, earthquake, aggression from Pakistan, and also aggression from China. So we have our hands full at national level also. So thus COVID impacted the individuals, society, and also the nation as such. So now, when we are talking about the impact of COVID on all this, then naturally when there is a negative impact of COVID, we also see that the outcome is anxiety, depression, devastation. Let us see how and what are the causes, four causes of this anxiety. First of all, the nature of virus. The, there is, I mean, there, uh, we, we all know the psychology uh, related to the fear of unknown. Anything that we do not know, we are terribly scared of. Why is it that the mankind is so scared of death? That is because we don't know what happens after the death. If only one man comes back and tells, see, this is what death means, then I think the fear of death will vanish from humankind. 
So we are afraid wherever there is ambiguity, there is some sort of uh, uncertainty about the knowledge level about what happens to us. So the high severity and susceptibility of COVID, what will happen, what will be the outcome, that gives rise to what we call health anxiety. Second thing is, particularly at the initial stage, you just recall your experience in the month of March and April, where continuously the social media was giving us a lot of information, facts, fictions, and rumors related to COVID. There was an information overflow and this, the human brain has certain limitation in processing the information, but the information that flooded on the human brain was too much for it to process. So there was a mismatch between the information flow and the information processing capacity of the human brain. As a result of which individuals suffered from what we call information processing anxiety. The third part, the nation came up with certain mandatory behavior to be practiced. The health behavior prescription was different. Uh, unlike Northeast, in the other parts of the country, we are not used to wearing masks. So mask is something which is suffocating people now. So wearing masks, washing hands, maintaining physical distance from each other, and not allowing guests, not going for any social functions, not going even for a funeral. See, India is an affiliation-oriented society. So that affiliation orientation is taken away from our society. What will happen to the human psyche? We are people who want to be with us, with each other, and who there is a collect collectivistic thinking in us. But that part of it, we are deprived of that part of it. As a result, there is a fear of missing out on certain things. There is a fear. I mean, we were, we, we were very new to this new set of health behavior of washing hands, sanitizing ourselves, etc. So every time there was a fear in people, have I missed out on something? Did I wash hands? Oh, I forgot my mask. So I should go back and get my mask. So this sort of thing is called compliance anxiety. So we are always bothered whether we are compli complying with the new set of rules given by the Department of Health and Family Welfare. The third type is the psychosocial adjustment to the lockdown itself. For the first time in our life, we are, we are facing an experience like total lockdown and work from home. As a result of which, the boundary wall between home and workplace is collapsed. Today, I'm sitting at home and I'm addressing hundreds of people from all over the country in a webinar. So the demarcation that I used to have between home and office is now no more there. As a result, there is a sort of work, I mean, uh, work life imbalance, and there is an anxiety of performance. I'm sitting here and I'm addressing people in a webinar, but I'm also, I mean, having at the, uh, somewhere at a sublime level, I'm also thinking of whether I have fulfilled the responsibility towards the family after this, what I need to do, which never used to be there. So these are the four types of anxiety that COVID has given us. And then when you're talking about anxiety, the experience of people, experience of patients, health workers, as well as the family members. Now, look at the faces of these people. There are the doctor, one doctor and one nurse on the extreme left of the screen. I don't know who they are. I can't recognize them by looking at their face. And this doctor, whom you see in the picture, he told me he works in a center, geriatric center, and he was attending on the COVID patients. He said that one of the geriatric patients, he asked him, are you the Yamadut? Have you come to kill me? 
So the fear, already the patient is under trauma of high fever and the accompanying psychological state. When the patient sees a doctor in all PPE, where barely even the skin of the doctor is available, the patient is not able to relate himself with that sort of figure. That creates a sort of COVID trauma in the patient. And in the second picture, you are seeing a quarantine center that was established in the month of April and May. So here, people are together, and yet they don't have any contact with the family. They can talk to each other. They're worrying about the family members who might have contacted to, and whose health care is also a question of worry. And here you see the patients being wheeled into the hospitals. The entry into the hospital itself causes a lot of anxiety. And then the whispers among the people, among the medical professionals in the ICU, that also impacts the patients a lot. And the sample, where, where the patients come to give their sample, even here, it is a very weird environment that an individual will have to face. So the perception of the patients is weird and the healthcare workers are working overtime, they're fatigued, and the family members are uncertain about the future of the patients, they are also worried. Now, what type of anxieties? Based on more than 2,500 calls in the helpline that we have set up, we identified the number of types of anxieties that we have right from March till now. So high susceptibility to COVID-19. In the month of March, April, and May, we used to get a number of calls where people used to feel anxiety because they might get infected. Non-availability of beds and oxygen for the patient. This is the situation now, the contemporary situation. Social stigma of being diagnosed with COVID. Unknown fear and insomnia. I mean, irrespective of the age group, we got calls from different age groups where they reported that they had some unknown fear and they could not sleep. Days together, people could not sleep. Then perception of social isolation due to social distancing and people who have their kin abroad, particularly in COVID high countries like USA, Italy, uh, I think we have uh, lost connection with uh, Professor Meena Hariharan. Uh, she will be coming back uh, shortly. Mm. So we'll just have to wait for a while. <clears throat> All right. Uh, good afternoon again, everybody. Uh, we got to know that uh, the entire area uh, of residence of uh, the professor uh, you know, the connectivity there is down in Hyderabad. So therefore, uh, we will go ahead with uh, uh, another presentation that we have been looking forward to uh, by Dr. Vanal Tanzani uh, on the topic cyberbullying relationship between perpetration and victimization. And uh, to do the honor of introducing her, I would like to invite my colleague uh, Dr. Lucy Lal Tanzavi, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are very fortunate to welcome Dr. Vanal Tanzami uh, as our next speaker due to technical problem. And she's from the Department of Psychology, Jeffrey Chia School of Medicine and Health Thank Sciences, you. Monash University. And Dr. Vanal Tanzami obtained her PhD in psychology from the University of Central Lancashire, UK in 2004. Her research activities focused on beliefs about aggression and the impact that culture has on these beliefs. And she is predominantly interested in specific forms of aggression, such as direct aggression, indirect aggression, physical aggression, reactive and proactive aggression. And she has several research publications in renowned international journals and is 
cited widely in her field. And after she obtained her PhD in 2004, Dr. Tanzami taught at the University of Central Lancashire as a lecturer and senior lecturer until June 2014, when she joined the Department of Psychology at Monash University, Malaysia, where she serves now. And she has had vast uh, research experiences at the Cyberspace Research Unit, University of C Central Lancashire, U UK. And we are very proud to mention that after earning her BA Honours degree in psychology from Delhi University, she did her MA in psychology from the erstwhile Mizoram campus of Northeastern Hill University, which is this department of psychology Mizoram University. Her teaching expertise is within the areas of social, cross-cultural and forensic psychology. She has given a lecture on the popular YouTube series that acts on the topic psychological perspectives on cyberbullying perpetration in March 2019. Ma'am, we are very happy uh, to, uh, for your presence and uh, your esteemed alumni, over to you, Dr. Vandal Tanzami. Hi, um, thank you very much for the, uh, the introduction and thank you to Mizoram University for having me. And I'm really sorry about uh, Professor Mina uh, with her uh, technical problems, but I think this is a, this is the new normal, isn't it? Everyone we do encounter, uh, uh, you know, uh, technical problems. And I really hope she will be able to come back and uh, continue um, her talk. Um, okay, let me share my screen. Right. So this is my topic, uh, but first and foremost, I, I'm, I'm, I, I must say that I wasn't expecting uh, this to be like this. Clearly, I have not attended many webinars. Uh, in fact, uh, I thought this would be a, a small talk, like a seminar, and uh, where, you know, a small intimate session where I could talk about uh, this topic. And the plan was to generate conversation, to generate, um, you know, discussion, I wanted to hear what people had to say, uh, you know, or what they thought about this, this topic. Um, so that was my plan. Uh, but anyway, I am going to talk about uh, my research in, in this particular area. Um, so without uh, further ado, um, let me just jump straight in, dive right into the um, definition of um, cyberbullying. Um, I am sure um, you know this is uh, the definition of cyberbullying is something that is not new to to us. I'm sure we all have some awareness of what it is, uh, but it is important to be clear um, uh, exactly where the distinction lies between cyberbullying and uh, traditional bullying as well. So basically, um, um, cyberbullying would be defined if you look at these key terms. So it is aggression that is carried out. So the key terms are things like it, it is intentional. So there is an intent to hurt the, the, the victim. And it is repeatedly carried, uh, it, it, it repeatedly occurs, and it is carried out through the use of um, electronic media. And this is uh, carried, uh, this, this is targeted towards a person who is not able to um, defend themselves um, easily. Um, so basically, cyberbullying is an evolution of traditional bullying. So, what is uh, So, if we look back into um, what traditional bullying is, uh, basically, yes, the same uh, key terms are, uh, are, are, are there in the definition. So that is, it is intentional um, to harm someone. It is repeated, so you continue uh, uh, to engage in this behavior. But with traditional face-to-face -face bullying, uh, what stands out is the fact that it is about systematic um, abuse of power. So somebody who is in a higher position, higher status, is systematically abusing their position of power um, to carry out this um, act of aggression. So there is power imbalance. And of course, strength is important. And status and things like that, all, all these are um, uh, related to uh, bullying. Um, and it is carried out by direct or indirect um, uh, forms. 
so with the advent of technology, so obviously there, there were new, uh, uh, there, there were other uh, forms of uh, other media in which, um, you know, this bullying could be carried out. So this, and therefore it evolved into um, um, cyberbullying. While some of the uh, components of bullying and cyberbullying are similar, as I said, in terms of intentionality, repeatedness, and things like that, um, there, there, you, uh, there, there are some quite uh, distinct uh, differences, a distinction between uh, traditional bullying and um, cyberbullying. Uh, so, for example, cyberbullying involves anonymity. So, you hide behind your keyboard, your victim might not know you, and you are not known to the victim. So, hiding behind that, so there is anonymity. And also, in the case of cyberbullying, the, uh, the whole point about status and power imbalance and all those things becomes irrelevant uh, because you don't need to be um, powerful, you don't need to be strong in order to carry out this um, act of bullying. Um, the other important uh, uh, component of cyberbullying is that of the presence of bystanders. So now in cyberbullying, you have so many bystanders, so it's magnified a million times. Um, whereas in normal face-to-face -face bullying, um, it depended on who was in the vicinity when this um, bullying was uh, taking place. Those are the bystanders. Whereas on the internet, everybody, if you, I mean, the potential of the internet, it can reach so many millions of people. So these are all the bystanders. Um, the important thing about anonymity also is that it leads to uh, de-individuation. And the adverse effect of that is that when you're carrying out this bullying online, you do not have any cues or you cannot see what the victim is going through. So for example, in traditional bullying, face-to-face -face bullying, where uh, you know, you're carrying out this act of bullying and you might see the distress that you're causing in your, victims, um, uh, in your victim, and that might lead to some amount of uh, maybe some empathy and you might stop. But in the case of cyberbullying, this, this does not happen because the, the bully is so far removed. They're doing it remotely. They're so removed from their victim that they have no, um, they, they are unable to see these cues. So of course, it is quite likely that there's going to be no, um, no empathy. And the other um, distinctive feature about the internet, of course, is the accessibility of the victim. Victims are accessible 24 hours a day. Whereas in traditional bullying face-to-face, whether the victim is present in front of you at that point, that will determine you know, whether the bullying takes place or not. But on the internet, the victims are there accessible all the time. So these are the key terms um, um, about bullying and how it, you know, and its evolution into um, cyberbullying. And um, of course, uh, the, the most common platforms on which cyberbullying tends to take place is um, social media sites such, and also through the uh, use of text messages and even things like um, online gaming. So why is this topic important today? Um, so just to put it into perspective and just to look into, uh, into the context of, of, of this, um, yes, it is a very, um, uh, a very relevant issue in our world today. And it, um, in a survey that was um, carried out last year, this was done by UNICEF. And when uh, the, they surveyed um, young people from um, um, across um, spanning 30 uh, countries, and they found that at least a third of the young people that they surveyed had uh, reported uh, being a victim of um, um, online bullying. So yes, and young people, children, young people are more vulnerable um, to this. So it is not, uh, I mean, it, is, it, it isn't a wonder why parents are uh, you know, fearful about the, the, uh, their children's safety. So in this survey carried out in, the, in Southeast Asia about um, almost two years ago, uh, in Malaysia, Singapore, um, Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam, uh, but they asked parents what they were most fearful for about their children. And you, you can see from the statistics that um, yes, almost 50% you know, uh, of parents said that they were afraid of their children um, you know, um, encountering cyberbullying. Um, the, the thing is like the world we live in, uh, you know, social media and the internet is just there right in front of us. And especially children, they, you know, the, the, the younger uh, children, the, the younger generation, they have been brought up in this kind of situation. 
um, in this kind of environment where online and uh, being online and everything that is online is um, you know it is it's really a part of their life so therefore it is so pervasive and this uh, I thought I just um, uh, you know uh, set uh, uh, mention this point just to set everything in uh, uh, give you the perspective as well um, you keep hearing things like this about how pervasive this whole you know the, this um, internet social media and all this is uh, when you ask children now what do they want to be they are much more likely to say that they prefer uh, you know they like to be um, youtubers um, social media influencers and things like that rather than other uh, uh, profession that used to be popular such as astronauts this was a survey that was carried out last year um, to commemorate, I'm sure you all know, uh, you all are aware that last year was the 50th anniversary of the moon landings. So to, comm uh, to commemorate that, uh, they ran a survey in um, uh, many, many countries, uh, surveying eight to 12 year olds. Uh, and they asked them, what would they like to be when, when they, they grow up? So kids, so this is um, eight to 12 year olds, um, kids in the United Kingdom and the United States, almost a third of them, so about 30% of them said that this is what they'd like to be. So YouTubers and bloggers, uh, as compared to astronauts, which was very unpopular, right down at about 11%. But this is not the case everywhere. Like for example, in China, the, the kids still want to be um, astronauts. But the reason I'm bringing this up is also to see like this is the environment our children are growing up in. And this is even before this time of uh, COVID-19, when now we are spending so much more time online. But what about uh, you know, COVID-19? How has that uh, impacted things like cyberbullying? And of course, I'm sure you will read, there's plenty of research, also very um, uh, recent um, um, research uh, suggesting uh, you know, the, in, the increase in um, um, cyberbullying, um, hate, uh, you know, uh, the hate talk and things like that online. I don't know if you are aware of this. There is one uh, website. Uh, it's called. Um, it's based on AI. It's AI based. Um, it's called Light, um, and they look at all the. They analyze all the um, uh, websites that involve like chats and Twitter and all those kind of things, and they analyze the content and conversations and things like that. And they found that actually. Uh, this is really, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure I, I found it hard to believe as well. There was a huge percentage of rise in things like hate speech um, on Twitter. So 900% rise in hate speech on Twitter. And that was directed at um, China and China related, you know, so uh, because of this, uh, of, the, of the virus. And also, uh, there was a huge uh, percentage of increase in people visiting websites where they could talk about, you know, anti-Asian, um, where anti-Asian conversations were being held. Children as well, um, there was about 70% increase in, um, you know, the, the, the kind of hate, um, in hate conversations between children and um, teenagers and also in um, the, this kind of toxicity was also found in um, online gaming sites. Now, if you actually read the transcripts of you know, the, what these children, young people are talking about, you would also be appalled uh, because you, you think like, would they actually, would people say such things would, in real life if they were face to face? Um, so basically it, it just seems to be like, you know, because they are, in these websites or, or on this or because they are anonymous they might be saying these things um so perhaps the internet it, it just seems that it brings out the worst in uh people um the other thing also to uh, you know what i started thinking was when i was reading going through the transcripts of these conversations it's like do they really know what they're saying or a, a lot of the times it might be because uh, you know they're saying these things to get a reaction uh, so that then tells you about the whole dynamics of uh, uh, bullying and hate speech and all those kind of things. Do people really mean what they're saying or is it just because, you know, they, they're trying to um, gain acceptance or they're trying to, uh, you know, um, get, uh, get, a, get a reaction? Okay, so I hope that, has, that puts everything into perspective and why this topic is so important today, especially in our, our world now. And now, yes, everything being online is the new normal. Um, I'm sure, I think maybe in India also, you uh, have not resumed uh, you know, all you know, 
schoolings or university life. Even here in Malaysia, uh, we are going to be online until the 31st of December. So our semester starting next week. And again, everything is going to be um, online. So we're spending more uh, a lot of time online. And therefore, this is a, 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 a really important um, issue to talk about. Um, so back to the, the research on this. Um, now here, I, I just want to um, give you a brief um, background into the, into the research on, on cyberbullying. Um, there is plenty of research there, but of course I can't talk about all this. Um, so I just want to give you the main uh, background. Um, so basically, um, what are the main f features based on a, a meta-analysis, um, um, a review carried, uh, carried out a few years ago, the main features that were associated with um, cyberbullying are um, moral disengagement. So uh, it, I think it is quite logical. People who are morally disengaged are much more likely to engage in uh, perpetration. And also um, people who hold normative beliefs about aggression. So normative beliefs about aggression basically means that you think that aggression is okay. So people who think that it is okay to be aggressive, to hurt other people, they are much more likely to engage in cyberbullying. And when it came to victimization, uh, what was most associated with this, um, it was stress and uh, suicidal ideation. Now, of course, there's many within this component, there are many, many, uh, you know, um, aspects. Uh, and if you are interested, I think, you know, this is one way to get you started for, or you can read this reference. Um, uh, you can read this paper. So, um, Looking at the theoretical aspect, the theoretical model of cyberbullying, so uh, cyberbullying perpetration. So why do people, you know, what uh, it, what leads people to perpetrate um, um, this this behavior, uh, this action? There have been a number of theories put forward, but one of the more 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 comprehensive theories is that of the general aggression model. You can see this uh, um, this diagram in the side here. This was basically, as the name suggests, based on aggression. So it was uh, devised to, um, you know, um, to explain aggr aggressive behavior, but it fits in very nicely with cyberbullying. So basically, uh, the main, uh, the, uh, what, what is key, what is central to general um, aggression model is the, the fact that we have these cognitive sc uh, scripts and schemas. So these are, these are the, uh, the, uh, the, the facets that are central to a general aggression model. Now we can explain behavior based on these three, uh, these, these three aspects. So first is the input. The input comes from the person or the, and the situation. So personal factors associated with the person. So the things that the person comes with and then situational factors in the environment. So both of these factors, they have an impact on how the individual feels at that moment. So what is your present um, what is your state at, at that moment? So, and your present state is based on your affect, your cognition, and your level of arousal, how aroused you are, what you think about it, how you feel about it. So it goes through that route. And then once it goes through that route, um, you decide, the individual decides, like it, it, the outcome is about appraising what to do. So the appraisal and decision-making process. So whether to carry out a thoughtful action or carry out the um, impulsive action. So when we talk about personal factors, as you can see here at the side, I have put all this down there. So personal factors are the things that come with the individual. So it could be personality, um, attitudes, beliefs, values, socioeconomic status, gender, age. So all are the, these are all the um, unique features that are associated with the um, individual. Then you have the situation. So situation is the environment. So within the environment, what are the factors uh, that might impact you know, the, the, the outcome? So for example, is there provocation? Um, are you being provoked? Um, is there a, a source of frustration in, in, in the situation? Um, is there things like, um, you know, are there aggressive cues? Um, or does the situation allow you to behave aggressively? Does it reward aggression? Or does, are there restrictions in place? So are there sanctions? If you behave aggressively, you'll get punished. So these are all, uh, the, these make up the situation. So together, the personal factors and the situational factors will go through this route of the, and will have an impact on your um, um, in, internal state. And then after you think about it, how you feel, uh, your level of arousal, then that will lead to carrying out that behavior or not. So 
For me, basically, I am very much interested in the personal factor. So as you'll see in my um, research, when I present you my, my, my research, you'll see that uh, I do work with things like um, gender. Um, I, um, I look at personality, attitudes, beliefs, and things like that. Um, th this other thing that is uh, more recently, well, uh, uh, what I just wanted to highlight again, considering our situation also, um, is the role of um, um, social media um, usage. So um, this social media usage is also very much associated with cyberbullying perpetration, as well as uh, uh, victimization. So uh, those who use social media more, and especially engage in problematic social media usage, are much more likely to in, uh, engage in cyberbullying perpetration, and also at the same, um, and also be victims of cyberbullying. Um, this was um, um, research carried out on um, young people, and the association between social problematic social media usage and cyberbullying perpetration and uh, victimization uh, was different for boys and girls this, the, the association was much stronger for girls than for boys um, and also this is because girls are much more likely to spend more time on on social media and so therefore there are chances of them you know encountering um, these um, cyberbullying behavior so themselves or being victims of um, cyberbullying. But basically what this research showed was that uh, problematic um, social media usage was the um, strongest and also consistently was a risk factor for cyberbullying perpetration and victimization. So the research that I conducted was carried out in Malaysia. So just to give you a bit of background on, on, on the research that has been carried out in uh, Malaysia so far on cyberbullying. So one study found that there was an association between narcissism, which is a personality trait. So basically narcissism is about, uh, uh, relates to uh, an infla uh, inflated sense of the self and also um, you know, the, the tendency to uh, uh, feel superior um, 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 to, to others. And that is associated with cyberbullying perpetration, but this relationship is driven partially by normative beliefs. So remember I said normative beliefs was about, uh, you know, how you view aggression that, okay, it's okay to be aggressive. Um, that in narcissism, um, um, cyberbullying. Um, other research also have found that uh, the main platform that is used um, to carry out cyberbullying is in uh, is social media. And also, uh, the longer you are on, uh, on the internet, your uh, internet usage, your frequency, that is also significantly associated with not just perpetration, but also victimization. And uh, again, like many other researchers, well, time and time again, we find that there's an association between perpetration and uh, victimization. So on this note, because my topic is based on, you know, the relationship between perpetration and victimization, I just want to go a bit further into this. Um, so why is there this vicious cycle between, you know, vicious uh, cycle of violence, uh, perpetration and uh, victimization? Why do victims go on to bully as well? Um, one way of ex uh, explaining this could be from the um, general strain theory. So basically this is a, a, a theory that it has been used in criminology a lot to explain things like you know criminal behavior, um, antisocial behavior, and things like that. So um, in in general strain theory, basically you ex uh, you experience strains in life because you have these strains. You want to uh, you know you you try to relieve yourself of these um, um, strains, and um, on the negative feelings these strains bring about, and you engage in uh, deviant behavior. Um, so basically, to get rid, to elevate your negative feelings that are brought on by the strains, um, you engage in uh, this um, negative uh, behavior, um, deviant behavior. So that is one uh, way of explaining this. But you also have the general learning model. This one uh, talks about uh, reinforcement. So basically, the main thing is that you learn this. So continuously experiencing behavior such as this. So if you are continuously victimized, if you are a victim, and then that becomes, that sort of becomes normative and that can 
uh, lead to attitude changes. So you start holding a positive attitude about the behavior. So even though you were a victim yourself, um, you did this. So it, it's about becoming desensitized also. So you develop, you form attitudes about, um, about that particular uh, behavior. Um, okay, so to go on to my um, research, um, so I wanted to look at the prevalence of um, cyberbullying perpetration um, as well as victimization amongst um, uh, adolescents in Malaysia. And the reason why, why is this important for Malaysia is because uh, uh, if you look at the internet survey that was carried out a few years ago, you'll find that uh, there's a high uh, usage of um, uh, the high percentage of population that are on the in, um, um, internet. Um, in the survey also, they found that um, Malaysia actually ranks 29th in the world in terms of um, internet usage. And um, here, if you look at these, um, uh, these statistics, you'll find that, you know, this is the amount of time they're spending. So 83% uh, uh, of, uh, of, of the people who were uh, polled um, said that, uh, you know, they, they spend the time on the internet every day and the amount of hours on average that is spent is about eight hours on average. And that's a huge, that, that's a great, I mean, that's a huge amount of time. That's sort of like one third of the, you know, 24 hour cycle. Um, so that is what led me to, you know, look into this, why, why, you know, we do need to carry out research in this area, in this uh, population. So uh, it was an exploratory study. So basically I want to look into bullying so face-to-face -face, uh, bullying okay so the personality factors uh, the personality factors that I was um, looking at um, is the dark triad so this is um, the unwanted uh, this the dark triad these are unwanted uh, you know negative personality uh, factors and uh, there have been a few research that has looked into um, the association between these um, unwanted behaviors. So not just with cyberbullying, but other forms of aggression and criminal, criminal activities and things like that. So um, the dark triad com comprises of uh, narcissism, which is an inflated cell, uh, view of the self. And it, you, know, you have a sense of entitlement and uh, feelings of sense of superiority. Machiavellianism, relates to manipulativeness, exploitativeness. So because you want to advantage yourself, so you're motivated by self-interest. And um, psychopathy is characterized by uh, callous and unemotional traits, lack of empathy, and the tendency to engage in uh, you know, um, antisocial behavior, risk-taking um, uh, and sensation-seeking behaviors. Uh, basically, in the past, the research has shown that there has been an association between um, all, all, all three of them is associated with cyberbullying, but psychopathy generally comes out as a unique predictor when you put all these things, all these factors, all these traits together, uh, which is something which, which tells you a, a lot about, um, uh, you know, cyberbullying. And if you're seeing like psychopathy, because if you think about narcissists, yes, they might engage in cyberbullying, but what motivates them to engage in cyberbullying probably because of their fragile ego maybe their ego has been you know uh, has been thwarted um, so in order to save face they engage in cyberbullying uh, machiavellianism uh, machiavellianists they might engage in cyberbullying because they want to um, gain something so they're trying to advantage themselves so they remember they're acting out of self-interest uh, on the other hand uh, uh, psychopathy basically just means that they are um, carrying out this behavior without any provocation and there is no remorse felt as well because they have they lack um, empathy the other personality factor was about uh, domination basically domination social domin uh, you know the need to dominate is very much associated with any forms of aggression because it's about you know putting yourself above others so you engage in aggressive behavior because you want to be domin uh, you you want to dominate over um, someone else so um, in, in the same way, uh, I, I looked at um, social dominance orientation. So this is a trait. This is about, uh, you know, your view of hierarchies. So um, the, the, somebody who is high on social dominance orientation would be someone who, who, um, 
who supports hierarchies, who thinks that yes, society would be better if there were hierarchies. They themselves might not necessarily be the dominant group, but they um, support that. Whereas someone who's low on social dominance orientation is someone who would, um, you know, who would say that everyone is equal and no single group should dominate um, any groups. The attitudes I was looking at are things like, um, so related to, um, specifically for cyberbullying, so the online world. So for example, anonymity. So how, what is your attitude towards anonymity in terms of the, you know, carrying out these behaviors online? So, um, and the other one was strength differential. Strength differential basically, as I, uh, I mentioned at the start, is that in, in traditional bullying, there needs to be, so the, the bully might, would advantage the bully to be stronger, more strengthful. Whereas in cyberbullying, that is not necessary. You don't need to be strong. Uh, you don't need to be physically strong. So this attitude, strength differential, so these two, an anonymity and strength differential, they are more, uh, more likely to um, enhance um, positive attitudes towards um, cyberbullying. And of course, traditional bullying, so face-to-face -face bullying. So we want, I wanted to see whether that was also associated with. So those who um, perpetrate uh, bullying in real life, in face-to-face, -face, are they more likely to also engage in um, cyberbullying? And I've already talked about the relationship between um, um, bullying and uh, victimization. So that's what I wanted to see. So these were my uh, predictions. So just like um, any, uh, so based on past research, generally males, and this is not just for cyberbullying also, but in aggression in general, that males are, are more likely, uh, they, they endorse greater um, uh, cyberbullying, aggressive behaviors compared to females. But when it comes to uh, victimization, especially for cyberbullying, there tends to be no difference. So I was expecting to find this as well. And there was some, uh, I, I did, I expected to find some ethnicity differences, although I wasn't, um, this was non-directional. I, I didn't have a set, you know, expectation. I did expect to find differences, but I, I wasn't sure about what, what to um, expect. Um, and how personality beliefs and um, experiences with traditional bullying and also victimization would predict uh, perpetration. So this was my sample. Um, you, um, high school students, um, or college um, level. So the mean age was 18 years. And in case you're not aware of the, you know, the ethnic division uh, in Malaysia, you have uh, Malays who make up the majority of the population, and then you have um, Chinese and Indian, and then you have other, other basically other indigenous uh, populations. So this was the, um, the landscape. These were the measures um, that I used. So I looked at um, online bullying, uh, cyber bullying, victim version and um, a perpetrator version. And I also looked at face-to-face -face bullying, so uh, traditional bullying. Then uh, for the dark triad, I used the dirty dozen dark triad scale and anonymity and strength differential questionnaire, as well as the um, social dominance orientation scale. So I'm not going to go into details of this because I'm mindful of time. And uh, so these were the, the measures that I used. And finally, what did I find? Um, so, okay, here are the um, descriptive statistics. So looking at the prevalence rate, um, this was the number of um, um, uh, the categories that they fell into. Uh, what you will find, uh, what I found, you know, I, I was surprised that this was also uh, the number of um, participants who fell into the bully and victim um, category. So they also were, uh, they had bullied and they also experienced victimization. Um, and for just bully alone was quite low, victim alone was also fairly low, but the bully victim uh, status, that's almost like about 66% um, of, of the population, of, of the sample fell um, into that category. So this again further highlights the, you know, the, this, um, the dynamics, the relationship between uh, perpetration and uh, victimization. Um, looking at uh, the difference between boys and girls in terms of uh, perpetration and victimization, as well as traditional bullying. So um, as expected, so perpetration, uh, males were uh, um, greater, endorsed greater uh, cyberbullying perpetration, as well as traditional bullying compared to females. But um, again, as expected, there was no difference in, in the experiences of uh, victimization. Now, there were some differences uh, in um, ethnicity. 
when it came to perpetration, there was no difference uh, uh, um, between the, the four eth ethnic groups. Uh, but uh, with victimization, you can see that um, uh, the Malay sample, they experienced significantly more um, victimization compared to the Chinese. And there was no other difference uh, uh, between the, 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 the comparison groups. And uh, why would that be? Because again, if you look at it, if you look at the means actually, you'll notice that even though there was no difference in perpetration, you'll also find that the Malays actually were highest in terms of perpetration. And if you're going to say that yes, perpetration and victimization are highly correlated, then that could be one explanation. The other thing I, I suppose would be that uh, these schools and places of um, education where, where I sampled the participants from uh, were mostly Chinese dominated um, um, areas. So perhaps the Malays in these um, institutions uh, were the minority and because of that, perhaps they experienced greater uh, victimization. And the same for, um, uh, uh, and for traditional bullying. Again, you can see here that actually Malays and Chinese significantly endorse greater traditional bullying compared to the other ethnicity, other which is the indigenous population. Again, remember indigenous population, they are the uh, mi minority. Okay, um, I think I'm okay for time or, yes. All right, so, uh, these are the, uh, so looking at the correlations, again, just to quickly go over everything you can see, all the variables that I looked at, they're all significantly associated, everything. So especially uh, the main thing you, uh, you need to focus on here is on cyber uh, uh, perpetration and victimization and how they're all associated to the uh, personality factors. And this side is the, uh, the, the attitude. So you'll find that all of them are um, significantly associated. And running a multiple regression, um, yes, the dark triad, they did significantly predict um, cyberbullying perpetration. But once you entered um, victimization, once victimization entered the picture, everything became non-significant. So basically, this highlights, again, the role, the impact of victimization, the extent to which victimization significantly predicts um, cyberbullying perpetration. And that was followed closely by um, cyberbullying, um, sorry, uh, traditional bullying. Um, on the other hand, you can also see that, yes, strength um, differential, that also significantly, um, and social dominance orientation um, did predict uh, uh, cyberbullying perpetration only. I only looked at perpetration uh, for, for this one. But again, looking at the um, uh, coefficient size, compare that to that of cyberbullying um, victimization, it is, it is very, it, it is minimal. There are many other things that I have done with this data, but I just wanted to share this much with you, this bit. Uh, I have looked at, you know, the extent to which, uh, for example, the dark triad, do they mediate, does it drive the relationship between perpetration and victimization? So there are other things that I have done with this, but for the purpose of today's talk, I just wanted to present this, this much. So to conclude, um, what, so, um, what 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 is our take home message from here? I think what I really want to um, uh, what I really want to focus on and what I want to uh, in impart to all the listeners is about the vicious cycle between cyberbullying perpetration and cyberbullying victimization. Um, here um, on this this tape um, this diagram again, this is the general aggression model, and here you can see how somebody who experiences applying that general aggression model, you can see how somebody who experiences cyberbullying, who has been a victim of cyberbullying, how they might go on to carry out, perpetrate cyberbullying. So look at the bottom part here. This is, a, a, so you have personal, like, um, so GAM says, yes, personal factors and situational factors. And then they encounter cyberbullying. And this impacts upon the, the, the route that it traps. So how do they feel cognitively? How are they feeling? What do they think about it? Um, how do they feel? They affect their level of arousal. So see this dotted line over here. Rather than going about, you know, carrying out a thoughtful action, so that is not being, uh, you know, carrying out this uh, cyberbullying, they then go on to execute cyberbullying. So this is the vicious cycle of cyberbullying perpetration and victimization. So future directions what can we think about all you know what, what do we get out of this um 
I am a researcher in this and I don't have the answers. Like if I can't give you a specific answer. So if you're asking me, how do you solve this problem? If one of your questions is, how do you solve this problem? I'm, well, I'm telling you already, I do not have the answer to that. But my research is just a drop in the ocean in you know, how we can uh, you know, uh, counter, how we can uh, you know, address this, this problem. So there are a number of uh, ways that uh, you know, we can um, counter this problem. Of course, continuous research is, is important. So for example, things like um, social connectedness, um, it has been found that they act as a, a protective, they, they act as a protective factor for, uh, you know, uh, a, a protective factor against negative um, feelings, negative uh, emotions associated with cyberbullying. So yes, social connectedness is uh, really important. Um, other things such as parental supervision, monitoring, these are also important. Now you'll notice that a lot of these things, uh, you know, uh, we're talking about young people. And yes, it is rife amongst the young. And as, as adults, we have a duty of care to ensure that they don't encounter these problems or to do our best to uh, resolve, uh, resolve their problems. But this is not to say that, uh, you know, cyberbullying does not occur amongst adults. It is very, uh, it is very rife amongst adults as well. But a lot of these intervention program, programs and things like that are aimed at young people. So things like parental supervision and monitoring are important. Uh, research has found that. But when it comes to supervision and monitoring, yes, parents might become worried. And, uh, you know, when they realize or when the ch uh, their child tells them that, yes, you know, I'm, being cyber, I'm a victim of cyberbullying. But the, uh, children, what re this research has found is that children actually want to, uh, uh, want their parents to be competent to deal with this, to get the support, rather than just the parents' knee-jerk reaction might be, okay, you're going to be removed, you're not going to see, you're not going to go on electronic media anymore, we're just going to cancel everything. Uh, but that's not the kind of controlling, monitoring that, uh, you know, that uh, leads to positive um, actions. So uh, young people want that, that, that they want, so as a parent, I guess you need to be authoritative, but at the same time also um, supportive. So rather than controlling all the sites that they visit, because if you put restrictions in place, what are young people going to do? They're going to try and find a way to bypass all these restrictions. Okay, so it is not enough to just say that, okay, get away from social media or anything and cancel all ele electronic media uh, medium, uh, but they have to be supportive with that, so that is important. Um, also things like, um, because other research has also found that uh, things like metacognition, basically metacognition is about your awareness of yourself, your thought processes and all those. Your, your, so if you have, um, are able to self-regulate, so your regulatory process and things like that, that is, um, you're, you're less likely to engage in cyberbullying. And also this data security um, awareness, it's about, uh, um, you know, if you know that uh, the, the things that you say on the internet, the things that you do on social media, they can be traced back to you. So people who have that kind of awareness, they are less likely to engage in um, cyberbullying uh, um, perpetration. So basically, um, bullies, because of the relationship between uh, victimization, victims and uh, perpetration, we can conclude, I suppose, that yes, bullies are also vulnerable themselves. So interventions need to address this. But we keep talking about interventions and things like that. Um, but what is more important is assessing whether these interventions actually work. So you can continue to do research and lots and lots of research and find many things. But if these intervent if the findings are not implemented in interventions, and even if they are implemented in interventions, you have to see, evaluate whether these interventions are working or not. So that is, I think, the future uh, to see, uh, you know, whether interventions are effective um, or, or, or not. And um, we talk about, so, so far we've been talking about intervention. So these are things that you can implement for children, for example, in the school setting. So maybe in, uh, in, in the school, in university, they might have, um, you know, they might have uh, um, a, a counselor or, uh, uh, to, to help them. So these kind of interventions can, can happen. Um, and yes, as I said, young pe uh, children, young people, they are most vulnerable. So yes, it is important that we have this duty of care to do, to do these uh, 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 
to carry out these interventions. But um, I think the more crucial thing is about adults. So cyberbullying is happening amongst adults. So what do you do about these um, um, adults? Um, can you implement interventions for adults? Is there such a way? So I suppose that that's a reason that there's a reason why, you know, countries have um, um, cyberbullying laws. So, for example, here in Malaysia, cyberbullying is, uh, is an offense. So, for example, um, soliciting um, um, in, uh, uh, comments or, you know, uh, spreading false information, indecent um, uh, information, um, anything that is uh, menacing or uh, abusive to other people, uh, using that information to harass people, that is um, um, a crime. And if you're found guilty of it, then it can lead to a lot of, uh, you know, a penalty, uh, uh, paying lots of lots of uh, money, as well as um, um, jail sentence as well. So I guess in various countries you have these, you can have these laws. Uh, but that is the thing that uh, I think, uh, you know, we need to address, we need to think about. So how do you deal with adults who might be engaging in um, um, uh, cyberbullying? Because with children, again, with young people, you can think about it, uh, you know, um, they have not fully, their brains has not fully developed, right? Because the prefrontal cortex, you know, it only, well, by time it, uh, someone reaches maybe in mid twenties, that's the time when it only fully uh, develops. So the prefrontal cortex, which is, um, responsible for things like executive functions, planning, decision making, and all those kind of things. So you can say that for young people, yes, that has not developed yet. But for adults, all that it has developed, but they still consciously choose to engage in uh, this kind of behavior. So I think um, as a researcher in this area, I think that is um, something that uh, I would like to look into. And I think this is the future direction of, uh, uh, for this research area. And to conclude, um, it is not, things are not all that um, negative. So while we're saying that, yeah, the internet and social media and all those things are bringing out the worst in people, but there are ways you can use it, um, you know, um, use it to your advantage, use it in a positive manner, use it responsibility, uh, responsibly. So for example, there is this game, uh, this, this was a, a finalist this year in the, Ed Tech um, Cool Tool Award, and it's a, a game about, um, it's called Galaxia. So this is a game that teaches life skills, and this was developed by Botvin, and the life skills, um, so uh, Botvin is, um, um, uh, you know, his area of expertise is within this life skills training, and it is evidence-based, and um, where players um, choose an avatar, and they're actually um, students in this uh, university, in, in the school, Galaxia um, 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 Academy, and uh, they learn to, you know, carry out to, uh, they, uh, they learn to practice all the uh, type of skills that are uh, crucial, that are important for young people, so things like their bystander skills, how to use social media um, um, appropriately. So using of text messages appropriately and things like that, um, their empathy skills and their coping skills and all those kind of things. So they learn to do that. So basically, there's a there's an uh, there is the principal of the academy and then there's an evil professor as well, and they have to navigate through that uh, campus, the university, the, the school's campus, and they face various challenges that you know um, high school students in real life would face. So things like peer pressure. Uh, uh, what else? Um, substance abuse, uh, bullying, and things like that. And they have to navigate their way and, and face all these challenges and work through these challenges. But at the same time, also, they have to uh, work as a team because they have to work as a team to fight against the evil uh, professor. So it teaches them about teamwork and team building skills and all those kind of things. So something positive can come out of, you know, all, uh, the inter so we so what I'm trying to say is that it's all not negative. So there are ways in which we can use um, social media and um, technology in a po positive manner, in a, a positive manner that can um, train young people and which they, uh, you know, uh, which they can, um, where they can learn all of these really important life skills. So I think with that, I will stop talking. Thank you very much for um, listening to my talk. And I look forward to your questions. Dr. Zami, thank you for a very insightful 
as well as a very contemporary topic, I would say. Because as we get uh, further into this coronavirus epidemic, we see that there is an increasing need for students, adolescents, and even um, undergraduate and postgraduate students to use the internet for educational purposes. So I believe that there might be increasing um, instances of bullying in the future. Hopefully there won't be, but there could be. So it's a very contemporary topic and thank you so much for that um, a very interesting presentation. I, we have some questions and uh, my colleague, Dr. Lucy, will ask those questions to Dr. Zami. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. There are lots of questions coming in. Uh, however, due to shortage of time, we'll try to uh, tackle around five questions. And the first question is, games like Blue Whale, Momo, etc., have led to suicidal tendencies and activities of children as they are under cyberbullying. How do they affect the mind of victims? How do they affect the mind of? The victims. The victims. So I think you can see how, um, you know, these, uh, these kind of um, websites, uh, I'm sure you all know, like the, the, the fate of, uh, you know, can lead to fatal results. So of course it leads, uh, it, it, it has a, a highly negative impact on, uh, on them. Um, but I think the more important thing is like the spreading of these kind of, uh, these kind of, uh, you know, challenges and things like that. Uh, why is that, uh, you know, why is that so right? Why are people doing this? So a lot of it is to do with, uh, again, peer pressure. So everyone is, you know, engaging in this or because they see someone else doing it, um, uh, uh, they, they are, you know, ca carrying out this behavior. So what I think is that um, even if, this, you see, this is about, it's not really about, okay, yes, they, they are being um, challenged to do these kind of things, but even if they were not challenged, the whole platform of social media that, you know, we are able to um, live our lives and show everyone what we're doing, all this is so important to people now. It's so entrenched in our minds. And this is what, you know, younger generations are, uh, you know, growing up to as well. Uh, so I think, that is the that is one of the uh, the, the the root uh, uh, problems. Thank you so much, ma'am. And move on to the next question. Uh, what kind of interventions can be used in individuals who have the dark triad? Um, okay. So basically. Uh, when we talk about intervention, so I think it would depend upon the motivations. So when we're talking about uh, these kind of um, dark track, what, what we measure, like the, 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 the scales that we use to measure dark triad and all these are not diagnostic tools. So because somebody is showing high psychopathy or high Machiavellianism or narcissism, we can't say that these are, you know, uh, uh, they, they, we can't use it as a diagnostic tool saying that they are showing these kind of pathologies. Uh, but what, what the kind of interventions that would be important, regardless of whether somebody had, you know, do these kind of personality traits or whatever, I think would be uh, the, the motivations. What motivates individuals to engage in this behavior? So if we get to the crux of the matter, so the, about what motivates an individual, so whether be it because, oh, okay, I have a fragile ego, uh, and every time someone uh, makes a bad comment or does not like me or, you know, all that, then I get angry and I lash out and I carry out these behaviors. Um, so whether it be that or it's because I want to further my agenda and things like that and I want to dominate over people, whatever the motivation is for cyberbullying, I think knowing that would, uh, would be a strong contributor to the kind of interventions that can, that can be used. Thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, another one last question is, what is the difference between cyberbullying and trolling? Okay, so trolling, I suppose, in this uh, uh, time would be, if you think about it, what is, okay, put, take all that away and think about what is the purpose of trolling? 
Is the purpose of trolling to cause harm? Are you doing it repeatedly? Uh, do you want, uh, you know, um, you want to cause distress in other people? Is that the, the purpose? If that is a purpose, then yes, it is cyberbullying. But um, so, so that is, I think that's why in today's world also, why it is, why I started off with, you know, the, the definition of cyberbullying, bullying, why it is so important, because these are the key features of um, cyberbullying about repeatedness and, uh, you know, that, that there is intention to cause harm. Um, in cyberbullying, again, uh, again, the, the really distinctive feature about this online uh, uh, medium is the fact that you might not have to do something and uh, you might not have to carry out a behavior uh, repeatedly, but because what you have done is on the internet and it is forever. So whatever is on the internet is forever and it reaches far and wide and everyone. So that um, uh, many cyberbullying researchers uh, refer to that as being um, equivalent to repeatedness. Thank okay. you. Does that answer your question? Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for spending your valuable time with us and on a very relevant and contemporary topic. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And I really didn't see the time. I'm really sorry. I think I took almost an hour to talk. So uh, I, 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 I don't know. Once I talk, I can't stop talking. So <laughs> anyway, and uh, yeah, and Professor Mina, so I'm, I'm glad you're back. And I'm sorry for the delay. All right. Dr. Mina Hariharan is back with us. Ma'am had experienced some, she had experienced some technical difficulties in her area as um, Professor Baby had said before. And now she's back with us. We are very uh, glad to have you with us again, ma'am. <laughs> and the topic was very interesting. And I'd just like to say before I ask you to continue that I myself had been, have been engaged during this uh, coronavirus pandemic as a counselor for the persons who were quarantined at the quarantine center. So I know firsthand that there is a lot of anxiety and uh, problems that people are facing while they are under quarantine. So it is a very, very relevant topic. And especially for me, it's a very useful topic. So without much further ado, ma'am, I'd like to invite you again to continue with your presentation. One second, I'll do that. Are you able to see the screen? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, so we were talking about the anxiety, different types of anxiety. And we talked about anxiety among the COVID, directly COVID affected people. And here we are talking about and the other part of it is the anxiety among people who experienced lockdown. So first of all, the anxiety was because there was a distress due to lack of accessibility to medical resources. As a result, in the month of May and June, we found that azithromycin, the antibiotic, high level antibiotic was, I mean, people started hoarding that. And then uh, because people were locked into their houses, they were looking at each other's faces 24 into seven and familiarity breeds contempt. So as a result, there were a number of interpersonal conflicts among the family members. And uh, many people, no work, no pay. The experience of no work, no pay definitely impacted them financially. And people who lost their family members to COVID. So it was disastrous for them because again, Indian culture being very highly affiliated orientation, oriented culture, we normally, I mean, go as a social support to people who are in crisis and particularly bereavement. We give a lot of social support. It is in fact intertwined into our culture and religion. So attending the funeral and then, I mean, the 13 days where the rituals are followed and all. So people who lost their family members to COVID-19, they missed this terribly. And this support, was, I mean, created a lot of devastation in them. And uh, 
Among the people who lost their family members, the two young children in their 20s who lost the father, they took him from hospital to hospital. And finally, when they went to the third hospital, the father, I mean, he died. And they were not allowed to bring the dead body back home. They had to, I mean, uh, head for the cremation ground from the third hospital, leaving the mother at home. So they took the father for treatment. They came back after cremating the father. So the mental, I mean, the psychological state of these two children were unimaginable. And they had continuous insomnia for days together. They had the feelings of guilt and they had the feeling of depriving their mother to have the last vision of the father's dead body. So it was a very complicated state. So grief, bereavement, guilt, depression over the death of closed one. That was, I mean, uh, something which will take quite a lot of time. And it has created a PTSD type of reaction in the family members. <clears throat> Then the other one, other problem that we uh, that the people faced was addiction to TV and social media, and this was creating a lot of health problems too. Then during the month of March and April, when there was total lockdown, the alcohol was not available, so a lot of people experienced withdrawal syndrome, and there was no immediate psychiatric help available to them, not no medical help available to them. And during the month of April, the video consultation was also not so popular. As a result, people suffering from withdrawal symptoms during lockdown one, I mean, there were a number of calls from these people. Presently, coming back to June, July, uh, a very uh, strange problem that the family is facing is to cope with the uh, schooling of children where the online schooling is on, particularly the families where there are more than one child, people are facing problem to provide appropriate resources to the children, providing them the gadgets like laptops or desktops or mobile phones. Parents are at a loss, not able to cope, particularly when they have more than one child in the family. Then what, how do we cope effectively? As I already pointed out, appraisal of locus of control is one of the factors which impacts effective coping. And then, the, I mean, it, there's a very peculiar condition that we are uh, facing. That is, I mean, COVID-19, the condition, the stress condition is stretching over months. So normally a stress situation is there and three weeks is the admissible time for one to recover from the impact of stress. But the stress is continuing. It, the stress itself is continuing for months in COVID situation. So now the best way to cope with this stress is to translate the adversity to advantage, convert the adversity to advantage. So in other words, in terms of coping, you need to transit from perception of threat to perception of challenge. So you need to attribute, the attributional factors will change. As a result, in place of perceiving a threat, one needs to perceive it as a challenge. The minute you perceive it as a challenge, the internal and external resource mobilization will start. And once the resource mobilization starts, the innovative methods of using a combination of internal and external resources will emerge. As a result of which, one, would, one is likely to cope with the situation more productively and emerge resilient out of this situation. So one of the factors is profitable investment of time and energy. Most of the people who reported high levels of anxiety, depression, they were the people who were not following a routine. So they totally deviated from routine because there was no need for them to go to their workplace. So as a result, the routine collapsed totally. And with the collapse of routine, the psychological, the negative psychological factors started taking the front seat. 
So now, instead of uh, deviating from the routine, our main comes, I mean, main advice to these people was to follow a particular routine and then invest the time and energy very productively. Invest them in uh, activities which you have been missing for so long, but now divert all the energy and channelize it positively. Then fear is one of the factors which is inducing high levels of anxiety. So the fear needs to be translated or converted to precaution. So fear is an affect state. It, it creates anxiety. It is a feeling. It is an emotion. And it is in the, it can be perceived as an affect state. So this affect state will have to metamorphosize into a precautionary behavior. Let us say that fear of contracting corona can be translated into complying with health protective behavior as a result of which the fear is addressed by converting them to behavior, protective behavior, like, I mean, the prescribed protocol when you go out wearing masks, sanitization, for following social distance, not getting out of house unless it is essential. So this needs to be translated to behavior. And then, yes, we all face crisis. And this COVID-19 situation is also one of the crisis situations. So now, what is it that you learn from this crisis? One of the main learning or education that we, I mean, that we take home is about the richness of Indian culture. And Indian culture normally, I mean, talked about certain cultural practices like namaste, like washing your feet before you enter the house, not bringing your footwear into the house, and then washing hands frequently. They're all there as in, in, in Indian culture. It is, I'm not talking about the religion, I'm talking about Indian culture. Now, uh, the health behavior protocol prescribed by the nation and by WHO, in fact, is coming back to the roots of Indian culture and asking us to reinvent this. So this is what we learned from this crisis and how rich our Indian culture is so far as health protective behavior and health promoting behavior is con concerned. And then coming to, I mean, once all these are done, then we would evolve resilient. Now, we did a small study by taking about uh, 12,000 social media posting to see how Indian society coped with coronavirus. We did a content analysis of these social media postings and we found that the society, Indian society, transited from one phase to another along the lockdown stages. In the first phase of lockdown, we found that the society coped with a lot of humor. If you can recall, a lot of social media postings, I mean, involved tremendous amount of sense of humor and humorous postings were there. Now, humor is a very productive coping technique. So ridiculing your own self and ridiculing your own position, laughing at your own miserable state is one method of circumventing the impact of stress. So Indian society largely used humor as one of the methods of coping in lockdown one. So, and this continued, it was predominant in lockdown one, but use of humor continued and even now it is continuing, but at a lower level. The other methods of coping took over humor in their intensity. And in the first phase, the other one was rumor. Humor and rumor went as twin brothers and there were a lot of rumors about COVID spreading and the impact of COVID and all because the information was not authentic. Then people learned, people started learning how to screen information. 
and they looked only for authentic information. I think by July, people know how to screen and only take into consideration what is coming from Ministry of Home and Ministry of Health and Family Affairs. They do not consider any other information. So in the first phase, the society struggled with a lot of rumors, and but that was a learning experience for the society. And in second phase of lockdown, lockdown continued. People were hoping that lockdown would end. But when lockdown continued, there were, I mean, a lot of social media postings were critiquing the government, central government, as well as the local government. And the, the vigilance about information enhanced. People started looking for information, waiting for information, so that the action depended upon this information. But another thing came along, which is very surprising. In lockdown two, lockdown one, about three weeks, people were idle. They didn't know how to sustain their health, how to maintain their health protective behavior, health promoting behavior. But when they came to lockdown two, people were concerned about their, I mean, lack of agility and restricted movement. So they started inventing methods to keep themselves fit and uh, to start physical exercises in different ways within the four walls of their residence. And in lockdown three and four, what happened was people first took care of their physical health in lockdown two. People started getting frustrated. They realized that they were in fact getting into negative effect and that bothered them. And then they started to look for avenues to revoke their positive effect state. They were bothered about their frustra low frustration tolerance, irritability and all, and they wanted to find out means of uh, revoking or invoking their positive state and sustaining it. And during this phase, you also, during this phase and also during lockdown one, there were a lot of postings relate, I mean, uh, manifesting people's patriotism. So patriotism was rampant in phase one of lockdown and it, uh, I mean, it, it again, I mean, uh, repeated in phase three and four. So phase three and four, where people started being creative. This, I mean, you, you would see a lot of postings related to creative art, story writing, poetry, writing, I mean, uh, writing uh, small, uh, um, um, small vignettes about the situations. And then the creativity also went into singing songs and distributing and spreading this positivity among their own circles. So the inference that you can draw from this study is you will see that people gradually graduated themselves from restricted environment to liberation of thoughts and liberation of feelings from negative to positive. This in fact gave us some indication that Indian society is gradually heading to emerge resilient from this COVID condition. So just to present you the data that we have collected, you will see that phase one, phase two, phase three are, I mean, uh, demarcated here. And I will just translate these phases to the psychological phases also. Phase one, humor, patriotism, humor, and also rumor. And humor is also a, I mean, method of distancing coping technique. Coping technique through distancing, denial. So when you don't want to endorse a crisis situation, you take, um, you take shelter under humor, you take shelter under denial, patriotism, something very positive. So you see that the psychological phase was one of denial. And in the second phase, criticism and physical fitness. So second phase, you will see psychologically, you can interpret that there was a lot of resistance innate resistance on the one hand and inevitable adaptation on the other hand. 
people were resisting this condition. People were initially they denied, but in the phase two, they accepted, but they were trying to resist, fight it out. And at the same time, within their limited uh, setup, they also tried to adapt to the situation. And then, and then you will see that in the third stage, there is a positive affect and creativity. Positive affect and creativity, they are the indications that despite all the adversity, you are trying to reinvent something positive in you and put it to manifestation. So emphasis on positive affect state and creativity is an indication that one is evolving resilient. So this is a very clear indication of evolving resilient. These are some of the humors I mean, post humorous postings that we received during this phase. I mean, you see that Yama is coming and telling that household, please stay inside, indoors. Don't come out and maintain social distance. This is Yama Dharma Raja, the, the, the Lord of Death. And here you see that when wine shops were closed, people were researching on how to separate alcohol from sanitizers. And then, how did this evolution happen? How did people come out of the stage of stress, distress, to a stage, uh, to a stage of resilience? Initially, people were in what is called a fear zone. So people were very scared and they were in a fear zone. They were restricting themselves. They were anxious, there were, there were, I mean, cases of insomnia, distress, panic attacks, anxiety, and all. But gradually, as the, as the situation continued, people went into what is called a learning zone. They started learning from their mistakes. They started learning from their miseries. And having learned from the miseries, in the third phase, they started experimenting their new ideas, innovations, and all, and practically putting it into real phase. And now people are in growth zone. People have sta gradually started, people are st gradually uh, translating the findings of their experiments into implementations in their daily life. As a result of which people are emerging and evolving as resilient. It is true in case of individuals, it is true in case of institutions, it is true in case of society, and it is true in case of India as a nation. We are also emerging and evolving as a resilient nation, despite all the adversities that we are facing. And finally, when you are looking at the healthcare workers, initially they were in a preparation zone, and they were asked to go into the battlefield of uh, healthcare, and they plunged into that without much preparation, without much idea of what it is going to be like. So in the second phase, it is called a heroic phase, where they wanted to do their best, and they worked day in and day out, as a result of which they experienced what is the reality. They found that it is very exhausting, they cannot continue for longer period, and because they worked over time, and then they accepted the reality. After they accepted the reality, they sought relief, and they said that they need to be relieved and substitutes will have to be sent. And during this phase, people started having substitution, and they were given breaks, and they started recovering and resuming. So this is how the healthcare workers started evolving resilient. Thus, the Indian individuals as Indian citizens, society as a whole, institutions and the nation evolved as resilient. So the essentials of resilience is there is an adversity. COVID condition is adversity. But despite that, we have not stopped achieve our achievement. We have got Rafael, I mean, yesterday, and we are working for 
I mean, we, we uh, with the new education policy was, you know, I mean, launched yesterday. And then we, despite all that, we are achieving, we are flourishing. There are certain uh, protective factors which are internal in nature, internal resources, and promotive factors which are external in nature. So the pro uh, promotive factors are provided by the environment and the government as such. Here I would very quickly take you back to recall the role of our prime minister who at different stages addressed the nation to communicate to the nation that we are all together. I mean, we are all together clapping and then, I mean, we um, um, lighting a lamp or candle and all. He put the flock together in the nation. And then they, he also spoke personally to healthcare workers to boost their image, boost their morale. And the healthcare workers who were working relentlessly were contacted by the prime minister. And the nation was kept as a united army to fight against this unknown enemy called COVID. And then uh, we started growing from the deficit to self-reliance in the sense we started growing. I mean, we uh, like Atmanirbhar Bharat that all of us know in even in education sector. Today, if you are able to conduct webinars, we are all self-reliant. We have overcome even a technical problem like Wi-Fi failure, and we still continue. We don't give up that easily. So that metal in us is there that is innate, and that is also enriched and encouraged at national level by the national leadership. So reaching out to people, Prime Minister also reached out to people, like, I mean, the people who recovered from COVID, people who are working very hard, and the pilot who flew the flight to America to get uh, our Indians through Vande Bharat uh, program. And this is something where somebody was leading us by example. And then COVID education by involving the celebrities. You just recollect what happened in the month of March and April. The, all the, I mean, on the television channels and social media, all the celebrities of the country were there to educate the general population about the precautions. And now we are at a stage when the lockdown is lifted. After educating the individuals and citizens thoroughly about it, the lockdown is lifted. And now, once the lockdown is lifted, we are like a tortoise. This picture depicts the post-lockdown condition. The tortoise is very happy because it got freedom from its shell. People are very happy that lockdown is relaxed. But the tortoise doesn't know that by removing its shell, the security is removed. People should also know that by lifting the lockdown, the imposed security is removed from them. And hence, people need to create a security around themselves by very strictly following the protocol. And rest of it is your imagination because our people are thoroughly educated through social media in the past three months and they should have self-accountability. And with, through that self-accountability and self-reliance, we are going to emerge as resilient. So it is very much there in our blood we have overcome several adversities through perfect coping, and we shall overcome this adversity. Hum honge kamya. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mina, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, time has gone a bit, so we will take only one question here. If uh, ma'am could answer this question. So the question is, how can we reduce the corona fear among the rural people and how can we improve their mindfulness? Ma'am, could you please unmute your mic? Yeah, please, can you please repeat? All right. How can we reduce the corona fear among the rural people and how can we improve their mindfulness? 
Okay, here I can uh, answer your question with an experience. Uh, um, rural my, um, migrant laborers coming from rural area, they had also called us on the helpline. And they wanted to go back, right? They were not aware. The awareness was very low. So as a result, I mean, the leader of that migrant laborer, what he did was he put the I mean, phone on microphone and the entire group was there. So he asked me to address the entire group. So I talked to them. I, brought, I, mean, I, I, I mean, it was a sort of uh, cognitive behavior therapy in a very preliminary stage, I should say, where the knowledge aspect of it was ingrained in them and they were asked to answer certain questions. And after that, they themselves came to the behavioral level of it. And this happened even in case of a rural teacher. Rural teacher got a few people together and then called our helpline. And then what she said was, look, I have these people who are going through heavy anxiety. So she put one after the other on the helpline and then made me answer their question. Basically, it is the CBT approach which is going to help the rural population. Because once the knowledge foundation is there, it will definitely impact the emotionality. And these two together, if you are familiar with protection motivation theory of health, then in protection motivation, the fear, a little bit of fear created in them is going to I mean, induce motivation and that will trigger health appropriate behavior. So this is the method. I mean, I, I won't be able to explain the entire thing in the short time, but you can take the example of protection motivation theory in bringing in behavioral change among the rural population. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. I believe that is a very practical solution that we can use uh, using a very modern technology and a very modern method. So thank you, ma'am. Uh, in spite of technical difficulties, uh, we are able to finish your presentation through the very topic that you have presented through resilience. Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay. And uh, I know that, uh, you know, we have gone uh, a good half an hour uh, extra time, but still we have majority almost all of our participants hanging on there and because it has been very very interesting thank you so much i know dr vanal tanzami you are two and a half hours ahead uh, to our time i know that it's very late for you thank you so much for hanging on there also and uh, even with uh, the hitches in the internet connectivity uh, on the side of Professor Meena Hariharan, we are able to complete everything that we were here for. You know, if uh, this is like a blessing in disguise, I would say this COVID thing, you know, because webinar, if it had not been uh, for the webinar, you know, we would not have this kind of, uh, you know, uh, meeting, you know, with so many participants from all over the world, you know, South Asia, you know, India, all parts of India, Northeast and the mainland and everywhere. So thanks to everybody. I cannot thank you, the, you know, the, the speakers enough. Uh, we will be sending out uh, the PPT, especially of Professor Meena Hariharan because, uh, you know, because of the disturbance there. And uh, of course, uh, you have a whole lot of questions, over 40 questions. And uh, you would like to see your questions, I think. So uh, our ICT officer uh, will be able to save, uh, you know, and send you all, you know, the questions that you have got. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, if uh, you would permit, we will also send out your emails so that the participants will be able to interact you with, to interact with you all further. So thank you all so much, uh, everybody. So. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you very much. And uh, also thank you to all the participants for staying with us and listening to us. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody, and bye-bye.
And special thanks to Professor Pente and the team for organizing it so well and bearing with all the technical problems. Thanks a lot to all the participants. I'm sure, I mean, I will try to answer uh, your questions. I have already sent my PPT to Professor Pente through yeah. email, exactly. and you can share it with the participants. Okay. Thanks Thank a lot. Bye, everyone.